You know, they say that every prospect who walks onto a showroom floor is, in effect, wearing a mask. And it's my job and your job as professional salesmen to remove that mask as fast as possible. The only way to do that, of course, is to qualify the prospect. And that is what this picture is all about. Now, I don't know any two salesmen who qualify prospects in exactly the same way. And for that matter, I don't know any two prospects who are exactly alike. But that doesn't make any difference. Because the prospects you're going to meet in this picture are, well, symbolical. The only thing they have in common is that, like almost every prospective car buyer today, they're economy-minded. But as you know, 56% of this year's prospects are still in that Plymouth, Ford, and Chevrolet price class. However, being economy-minded, most of them are intrigued with the publicity and novelty surrounding the new compact cars. Actually, only one out of three is a prospect for a car like Valiant. But how do you and I know who's who? The only way to find out is to get behind that mask and qualify. Let me show you what I mean. May I help you? I'm just looking. Uh, what about these economy cars? You see, I drive a lot and I have to buy my own gas and oil. Even when you use a credit card, you still have to pay for it, you know? Yes, you're right. Hold it. Good. You know, there's one thing I like about a motion picture. If you stop something, you know you can't start it again. That doesn't always work in our business. The first thing to think about when you approach any prospect is, don't burn any bridges. Don't back yourself into a corner where you'll have trouble selling yourself out. Now, what is the best way to handle a man who quits looking in through the window, who walks in and asks about the small economy cars. There are three parts to that word economy, the original cost, the cost of operation, and what you get when you trade. But how many parts are there to a sale? Here's a simple pattern that helps. It's just a matter of qualifying the prospect before you qualify the product. It starts with a big question mark, why? Just ask yourself, why did he come in? Why did he ask that question? Why? 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 Let's arrange the letters vertically. Let's take the first letter, W. Who is he? What does he do for a living? Where does he live? What about his present car? Where is he on payments and so on? The more intimately you know him, the faster you'll be able to get behind the mask and have him qualified. Now the H. How will he use the car? Hundreds of miles a day, lots of trips, or just around town? How many people are going to ride with him? Children, elderly people? It all makes a difference, because what he really needs may or may not be what he thinks he wants. If you think he's attracted by, say, novelty, you want to be sure that what you sell him today isn't going to make him a very unhappy guy six months from now. Now, once he's really qualified as to who he is and how he's going to use that car, then you know what to sell him. You are ready to fit him into the car that's right for him. Maybe you should waltz him over to the used car lot. Maybe it's a Valiant, a Plymouth, a DeSoto, or Chrysler. We want him in the family, but until you get the answers to W and H, you don't know which car is right for him. The way you get these answers is up to you. Sometimes you get them, or, or part of them, if you just listen, like this. Uh, what about these economy cars? See, I'm an insurance salesman, and I drive a lot of miles in a week, and uh, I've been shopping around. Uh, you know, there's the one with the engine in the back, and then there's the other one, and, well, I've been hearing a lot about yours. Is that so? Let's hold it again, please. Now we're getting into the first part of why. And we didn't even have to ask. We just listened. Now we know what he does for a living. We know he drives a lot. And naturally, he's interested in the economy. But wait a minute. It isn't all as simple as that. At this moment, we still haven't been able to get completely behind his mask. 
And we have to get close to him. Really get behind that mask. Get inside of his mind, so to speak, in order to find out who he is and what he needs to make him happy. I'll tell you what, let's exaggerate this situation a little bit and actually try to get inside his mind, and symbolically. Well, inside my mind, eh? This is kind of fun at that. Maybe I can save the salesman some time. He'd find out in a few questions anyway. He already knows why I'm interested in economy. And he would be too if he had my gas and oil bills to pay. My, those bills. But what I can't understand, and I'm a salesman myself, you know. No, I guess you don't know. And a lot of people wonder about it too, including my boss. But what I can't figure out is why he won't start to sell me a Valiant. I think I'll ask him. I don't get this. What you doing? Why don't you start selling me a Valiant? I gave you a perfect opening. First, I have to find out who you are and how you're going to use the car. Then I'll try to sell you the right car for you. But first, I have to get behind that mask and inside your mind. So why not let me get inside your mind? And I'll try to explain. This is kind of crazy, but I guess you can do anything in a movie. Well, <laughs> come on in. Nice in here, huh? Now, what's this about who I am? Well, this is important to both of us. The worst thing I could do for you is let you buy something you might think you want right now. And then later, for any reason, have you be sorry you bought what you did. Sorry? Heaven's sake, why should I be sorry? I might sell you too much car, or not enough car. But if you're happy and satisfied with what you buy today, and you're just as happy and satisfied, say, six months from now, that's good both ways. You'll talk to other people about it, and uh, you'll help me sell some other people. At this moment, I'm not ready to sell you anything. You're not? No, sir. I start with finding the answers to a little word, why. Who are you? What do you do for a living? Where you live? Your family? And all that. Well, let's see if I can answer. I'm driving a 57 Ford. It's paid for. I'm married, buying a house. It's a nice little house. No children. My wife doesn't drive, but I do. Brother, do I drive. I sell insurance, and my territory covers three states. Three states, and they're big states. And if half what I hear about the economy and comfort that's built into a Valiant is true, boy, I want one. That's the car for me. Okay, thank you, sir. I think you've given me all the answers I need. Now I'm ready to start selling. See? Once I was able to get inside his mind, I was able to qualify him like that. I'm going to sell him a Valiant. I think you would too, because he fits right into a Valiant. Now let's try the same approach with a little different kind of prospect. Here we go. Now, now Charlie, you do all the talking. This is the Valiant, honey. Remember yes, I... Yes, sir. Oh, hello. Just looking. Kind of intrigued by this one. Uh, we're pretty proud of Valiant. There's a great story back of that car. The Chrysler Corporation has been working for 25 years to build a compact car that would be roomy enough and comfortable enough and powerful enough, but not an inch too long or a pound too heavy. You see, economy is important. That's what I'm interested in, economy. Right, honey? That's right. Charlie says he's never going to drive a big car again. Uh, most people are interested in economy these days. But I'm sure you know you can still have economy and a big, solid car with lots of extra comfort, style, and trunk room, and all the rest of it. Well, but don't tell me. It's up to Charlie. I want you to have the car and the deal that'll make you both happy. Do you drive a lot? Oh, no. Hazel drives more than I do. Do you live around here? We run the Central Market, about eight blocks east. Live upstairs. Oh, yes. Do you have a family? Three kids and a dog. A Dalmatian. You never saw such a dog. If the kids go along with Hazel, the darn dog always has to go along. What are you driving now? Chevy station wagon. Say, you ask a lot of questions. Well, as I said, I want you to have the right car for you and your family. And the dog. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget the dog. No, sir. But I want to sell you one of these two cars right here. We'll look at them now from the standpoint of economy and style and comfort for your family. Charlie, you know how those kids are when they get tired, wiggling and squirming. Hold it, please. I've got
get them qualified right now. I'll bet you have too. Just by asking a few questions and listening, we have the answers to W-H-Y. They've been motivated by misinformation and novelty. A few cents a day, a few dollars a month is going to make them a lot happier in the long run. And I want them to be customers for years. So, I'll get them over to the Plymouth. This is a big, solid, comfortable automobile. You can see that just to look at it. But let me show you a few things that are engineered into Chrysler cars that aren't so obvious. You're interested in economy. I certainly am. Do you know that Plymouth is so easy on gas, we've won the mobile gas economy run in our class for the last three years? Yeah, I think I read that in the papers. That's right. After a minute, I'll lift the hood and show you some of the reasons why we win prizes like that. But there are other reasons other than just the engine. Take a look at the front end. I want to show you some of the reasons why you can have this big solid car and economy too. Both the exterior and the underneath lines have been redesigned and not only for style. Did you know that in conventional cars at about 40 miles per hour, it takes about half your gas on the highway just to push air? As much as that? Half? You'd think every car would be designed to do what it has to do. Buck the wind, among other things. Well, aren't they? No, but Plymouth is. This is a practical aerodynamic design, thoroughly tested. And this design helps give us economy. Let's walk back this way and look at the clean lines. Engineers know all about the center of gravity and how it can move around. There's a right place for it in a car, forward. Just as there's a right place for the center of pressure, uh, wind pressure, that is. I never thought about that. No, but our designers did. These rear fenders look smart, sure, but they do something for you. They're stabilizers. Driving down a highway in a crosswind, they move the center of pressure way back and stabilize the car. That means 20 or more percent less steering corrections. And that's economy, too. This is one of a lot of special extra things you get with Plymouth. A lot of them aren't obvious, and you don't even know about them until you've driven the car for a while. You'll notice it's a quiet car, a solid car, the very first time you drive it. Now what you like later is that it stays that way. It's roomy and comfortable, and it's built to last, and then some. That's economy too, you know, the very best kind. I guess it is. Well, I'll get to the uh, biggest part of the economy story in a moment. But look at that body, solid. That body was prime painted twice, then baked and sanded, enameled twice, baked again. And the result is what you see now, a brilliant, tough, beautiful finish that you won't have to wax for years and years. That's more economy. And another thing, corrosion. I want to tell you that whole story, but I can sum it up right quick. The Plymouth body is actually dipped into a series of anti-corrosive vats, then paint protected in the same way. It took a lot of doing in a lot of places, but you don't have to worry about corrosion. I know, that's economy too. Oh, Charlie, I really like this car. Hold it. As I said, there's been so much publicity and conversation about the compact cars that you're going to get a lot of people who are drifting toward one without really thinking it through. That last couple wouldn't have been satisfied with a small car, not even the Valiant. They can have that economy with that terrific new 30D6 and have the big, solid, comfortable, family-sized Plymouth too. You know how you'd sell them from this point, so let's try another kind of prospect. May I help you, sir? I'm Jim Dennis. Well, I don't know. I've been thinking about these small new cars. Ought to be easy to park. Oh, they are. But aren't you Dr. Marks? Yes. You're young Dennis. I knew your father. Sold me my first Chrysler, oh, too many years ago. I'm still driving one. Got a lot of respect for Chrysler engineers. Know their business. They certainly do. Is that your Imperial out there, Doctor? Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about the second car. What's wrong with that? That's what our competition is trying to find. Not a thing. We're proud of the Valiant. Well, it's got all the things, hasn't it? I mean, you can get it with power steering, power brakes and all. It's compact. I like that. Is this car for your wife, sir? Yeah, she's got a 1958 Plymouth convertible. Good car. She likes it. But she got interested in these little foreign cars. 
wanted to buy one last year. Don't go for much of this European guff myself. I want to buy a car where I know I can get service and parts. Don't want to have to send to Germany or someplace and wait for replacements. That's just good sense. And your wife will still want the things she's grown to like in a car. I mean the advantages of styling, unibody, torsion air, push button drive, and all the rest. Right, of course my wife doesn't drive a lot, just around town, shopping. How these women love to shop. To the club, over to somebody's house for bridge. Are you married? Uh, yes, sir, I am. I thought so, well then, you ought to know. Yes, I sure do. Hold it. See, there it is again. We have all the answers we need. We've been able to get behind that mask and qualify with the answers to the word, why. We know he wants a second car for his wife. We know who he is and what he does for a living. He's a loyal owner, so is his wife. She's driving a 58 Plymouth convertible and likes it. How will she use it? Mostly around town, money is no problem. It's obvious that it would be wrong to encourage them to buy a small car. We're already more than halfway to a sale and you know right now what to sell them. The pattern for qualifying, I think, is easy to remember. It's just a matter of getting the answers to that little word, why. First, who is he? What does he do for a living? Where does he live? What about the payments on his present car? What kind of a car is it? Then, how? How will he use it? Drives lots of miles or just around town? How about children and the dog? All of this information brings you up to the moment when you feel, there it is, he's qualified, and you're ready to fit him into the car that's right for him. And speaking of the car that's right for him, don't forget that two out of every three people you talk to are prospects that are right smack in that big, stable 56.2%, or half the total market. So get the facts first and it will make the selling much easier. Get behind the mask by starting with that little word, why, W-H-Y. Who is he? How is he going to use the car? And when he's fully qualified, you'll sell him the right car for that particular unique individual. Good luck. And with that little word, why, you'll have good luck in 1960.